Strength in this whole world till the end is knowing that you have my life in your hand and my life is living proof that anything can be possible with you in the plan. Um the next speaker will be Rabbanit Leah Johanathan, and um, she really needs no introduction whatsoever. Uh, a couple of years ago, I started taking classes, I had the privilege to start taking classes at the academy, and um, my class was with uh, Rabbi Johanathan, Rabbanit Johanathan, and I would go home from work and um, get changed in, uh, this is in Brownsville, and then drive to Beth Elohim in Queens. And I would find that on the way there, you know, I'd be honking my horn and trying to cut people off in traffic and everything. And then it occurred to me, I'm trying to get to class. Why would I be doing this to get to class? But the, the, the truth is, the, the wisdom and the beautiful spirit and the, just the, the atmosphere, just to be in the presence, uh, was so wonderful that it didn't feel like class. It was a privilege. And... Uh, Without any further ado, uh, please stand and welcome Rabbani Johanneton. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. First and foremost, giving honor to the creator of the universe in whom we all live, we all move, and we all have our being. To the honoree in our midst, the esteem, Toda. Rabbi Hailu Paris, whom I've known for many years also, and to also the senior rabbi in our midst, Rabbi Yohanneton Ben. Rabbi Yehoshua ben Yohanneton, my spouse for 57 years, and to all the men of the Beamer and those who were visiting of the cloth, to all my imas, brothers, sisters, Bat Yisrael, to the entire Kol Yisrael congregation, Shavua Tov, and Hat good to be here. Yes. You know, I, as I sat and I listened to Rabbi Paris, I went back, really, to the times that he spoke about. I remember many of the names and the pictures that you showed Rabbi Paris, and that's a legacy. And that is our history also, which was put into the Schomburg and that is one period in our history, too, that will remain with us because that legacy will be there. Although we feel a void in some instances, and we will pray that Hashem will open up the gates of heaven and the sanct from his high holy place and shower his blessings down upon us, that he will restore us and make us a beautiful flower garden. I begin this dissertation with a question. And I was wondering, what am I going to say? And one mind said, well, say what you say always, the best. I talk about prayer because it's strong and it's needed. And I talk about Torah because it's our guide. And I talk about Yisrael because that's who we are, Hashem, a special people, he says. You only have I known. And he also said, for what purpose is Yisrael in this earth? And I ask that question 
What is our purpose in earth? The purpose of our lives is far greater than our own personal fulfillment. In many instances, it becomes far greater than some cases our families, so to speak. Our careers. What do I want to be? What do I want in my life? Do I want to be a politician? Do I want to be a teacher? Do I want to be this? Or do I want to be that? Dreams and ambitions. But if you want to know the truth, we are focusing at the wrong starting point because the search for our purpose on this earth begin with the eternal, our Elohim, who gave us life, gave us Torah, right. And Torah, life, our guide. It is stated that it is Hashem who directs the lives of his creatures. And everyone's life is in his power. Israel was ordained by Hashem to be a light to the nations of the earth. It propounds a conception of the Hebrew people as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation through whom all the nations of the earth are to be blessed. That's Israel. And the Torah, our guide, is a revelation from Hashem, creator of the universe. And without this revelation, man, and especially Yisrael, would be completely ignorant of his creator, his past, his presence, and his future. Now this revelation contains a code of ethics that is absolutely perfect in its meaning. And the prophet Moses, who presented it to the Israelites, claimed to have had no part in its formation whatsoever. In fact, he states that the law was even written with the finger of Hashem. Exodus 31.18. The psalmist David tells us that the law of the eternal is perfect, converting the soul. Psalms 19.7. And in another place he says, thy commandments is exceedingly broad. Psalms 19.96. This is evident when one examines the law and there is no virtue to that is not included, no vice that is not covered and condemned. And by those 10 brief commandments within these statues is uncontroversibly proof of the presence of Hashem himself. Now, I go further and you might say, why is Rebbe Yohanan telling us about Torah? We know this already. Torah, yes. But Torah is much more than a narrative and we read about it. For among other things it sets forth, it is systematically at least most vividly a doctrine concerning one and universal Hashem, the creator of all things, the lawgiver, the liberator, the redeemer of all men. It outlines an ethic of justice, loving kindness, and sometimes these moral principles flare into white incidents as to the Decalogue or the holiness, the codes of Leviticus, the 19th chapter. And we all know the 19th chapter of Leviticus. And more generally, they are assumed and applied in one guise or another. Not a line in the text is devoid of them. And it prescribes rituals, holy days, festival seasons, together with pertinent forms of worship and observance. It promulgates a code of law 
ecclesiastical, civil, and criminal. So everything is there. It's complete. It ordains institutions, religious, and I use the word religious advisedly because I like to say spiritual, domestic, social, philanthropic, and political, yes. Because if you don't have good political guides, they will lead the nation astray. So we do pray that Hashem will put men in the government that will have mercy upon his people. Amen. It propounds a conception of the Jewish people, of the Hebrews, Hebrew Israelites, whatever we want to call ourselves, a people, a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation, and through whom all the families of the earth are to be blessed, as I said before. But beyond all of these, it constitutes a monumental literary achievement. It was a superb stylist who wrote the thundering chapter of Genesis, an uncannily expert storyteller, unwind the poignant, haunting story of Joseph, and no mere talented rhetorician compose the farewell oration of Moses or conjured up the picture of the dying prophet seeing the promised land from afar that he would not enter. Torah. And to the religious man or the spiritual man of the Western communion, this is the Torah book of life, if you want to say, of the generations of his belief and the seed from which sprung the theological and moral premises by which he lives, the spiritual man. But to the professing Jew, the Israelite, the Torah is all these and infinitely more. It is not only a source of what he is as a Jew, as a Hebrew, as an Israelite, a religious person, it is much of the substance as well. Do you see what we represent in the earth? And do you see why I need to talk about Torah? Why? So that we don't lose our way. Torah a special book only in its most restricted sense. And there are broader connotations to the concept and other significance, still more comprehensive than these. In their aggregate and latitude, they constitute a whole world of ideas and values. Torah, a Hebrew noun, derived from the verb which means to guide, to teach, quite simply and literally, therefore it stands for guidance or teaching, or to borrow one of the words from the Latin origin, it's a doctrine that we follow. And once Torah is so rendered, its broader connotation virtually spells themselves out. Obviously the teaching did not cease when Moses, or the books ascribed to him, the prophets carried it on. And so did the poets and the sages who composed the Psalms, the Proverbs, and Job. Hence the latter books of scriptures, while not Torah in the letter, are very much Torah in the spirit. Right. And I want to impress that, how it's very necessary in our time but let the great men of Torah then speak concerning it. And those who, being close to it and knowing it best, can be more articulate about it. And from their words, we shall be able to form some estimates of its impact on the individual, on the community, and the universe. And to the book of Deuteronomy, Torah is the life and good, which is set before man as an alternative to death and evil. And at the same time, 
It is Israel's wisdom and understanding in the eyes of the nations. So how dare we not represent Hashem in the line of Torah? Right. And to the prophet, it is the water from which all men thirst, the bread from which they starve, which is yet dispensed without silver and without price. And to the psalmist, it is the light in which he sees light, or alternatively, the spiritual sustenance, whose taste is sweeter than honey, right, and the drippings of the honeycomb. And to a rabbi, a spiritual leader, ancient days, modern times, it is something to be dwelled into further and further, since all things are in it something over which a man may grow gray and old, yes, but never stirring from its contemplation, knowing that he can have no better pursuit or rule than Torah. Torah, the binding unit religiously for all Jews, all Israel, is also the theme of their fundamental disagreements at times the continental divide, as it were, at which the traditionalist and the modernist begin their divergence. But the basic distinction between the two viewpoints is this. Torah, the whole Torah, to be God revealed, therefore unimpeachably true and good throughout. There's nothing better in life than Torah. Now, after all that I have said, you might ask that question, why, Rabbanit? Yes, all this about Torah, our guide, our bridge, our light, our teaching priest, male or female, be they, our families, our children, our communities, our synagogues, our Bet Mikdash, our sanctuaries, our hope for a better tomorrow, our legacies, yes, hope of ages past, we saw it all before us today, depends upon Torah, la door the door, from generation to generation. Yes, yes, yes. And our love for Hashem. Amen. And each other depends upon each and every one of us to stop the decay and the disrespect that is running rampant in our communities, the destructions of the house of worship, the abuse, the disrespectful women, not teaching our children, not honoring the Shabbat day and keep it holy, not honoring thy mother and thy father, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou should have no other creator before him. And all of this was given to the house of Israel. And we all will share in the glory of Torah, or we all will fall in the demise of Torah. Torah is life. Torah is our gift of everlasting life. Torah was given to all the nation, but we are the keepers of the sanctuary. <laughs> Judah is my sanctuary, said Hashem. So let us, Yisrael, be very cognizant of what time and what period we're in. We see all kinds of atrocities that's upon the face of the earth. We see the mighty work of Hashem. We see the wind, and the water, the fire, the life being taken. Wind, water, water, fire, life, the power, yes. And above all, the nefesh, the mind. And pray that Hashem will give us mental stability, 
Pray that Hashem will give us long life so that we will see the sages who went before us within the men that sit still in our midst. And the mothers of the house of Yisrael who would teach their daughters the law and their daughters will look and seek those who will also continue that spiritual vibration. And the children will be taught. The children will be taught. One letter, one word, one sentence, and one paragraph. And that person is to be honored who teach you one letter of law. Shalom Uvraka. I am so honored to be part of this honoring of Rabbi Halu Paris. He is an absolute treasure in the community, not only in this community, but worldwide, internationally. Please stand and welcome our rabbi, our own Rabbi Halu Paris. Brothers and sisters, Shalom Aleichem. I give the Almighty great thanks and blessing for enabling me to be here today, <clears throat> give me the strength to come out and participate in this function. I'm very grateful after so many years, I'm not going to mention how many, <laughs> that I've been with the community and uh, uh, you know, we've, we've, we had a struggle. We've been struggling for 50 years. And as the sisters say, we're still on the struggle. We haven't stopped yet. <laughs> I don't think we'll ever stop. Uh, there's a lot of things for me to say. And um, what I, uh, there are two people that I want to make special mention. And one of those is our Gabai Lee. Gabai. <laughs> We go a long ways back with our commandment keepers, time with Rabbi Matthews, and then later on with Rabbi White. And we uh, pray these days that there is controversy of different type. We ask the Almighty to bless us that we may be able to solve it and bring peace to the camp. This is a unique community. Now, you heard a beautiful presentation by Princess Zaria that uh, the Hebrew Israelites that she knew and that she grew up with were here in Brooklyn and Queens and Manhattan also. And I know many of them, I remember many of them. In the days when I was at 204 Lenox Avenue with Rabbi Wilkins and Rabbi McLeod. <laughs> One of the things that, that uh, she mentioned slightly is that the groups that were Hebrew Israelites slowly became Jewish, got close to the rabbinical order. And my uh, duty today is to give you a little history of how that process began. Rabbi Winfield Matthews was a person that was born in the West Indies, as Rabbi Ford was born in the West Indies, and they came here in the early period of the 20th century. At the time they came, there was also a great speaker. One was called a prophet, Marcus Garvey. And Marcus Garvey woke up people in a way like the prophets woke up Israel. And there were hundreds and thousands of 
people of African descent throughout the world, North and South America, that woke up to the fact that they were a people that came from a continent that was ancient and gave a lot to the world. And so Marcus Garvey injured, in, in, energized the black community in New York City. And because Harlem is like the central spot for the black world, his message got out to everyone throughout the world. And part of that message was that we are to go back to Africa. Africa for the Africans, Europe for the Europeans, Asia for the Asians. And so two of our founding members of the Ethiopian Hebrew congregations in New York, Rabbi Matthews and Rabbi Ford, came to him and became part of the UNIA. Rabbi Ford was a musician. Many of the hymnals and songs that you heard that was uh, mentioned in the uh, writings of the uh, UNIA history and, and research volume was written by Rabbi Ford. He was musical director of the UNIA. Rabbi Matthews was a member uh, that was at that time did, did not recognize himself as an Israelite, and he maintained the tradition that he grew up with his parents. And it wasn't until he came in contact with Rabbi Ford that he woke up in him that he was more than he was taught by his parents. And so the time came that Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Matthews and Rabbi Ford came in contact with many of the Africans. It wasn't just the Ethiopians. They came in contact with many Africans at the time when Marcus Garvey was waking up the black world. One of those Africans that he came in contact with was the one who, uh, who uh, represented the Ethiopian government here in the 1920s. The name was Tamir Emanuel. I met him when I was in Israel uh, in the 50s when I went on a scholarship, and he was a, a very old man. Uh, Tamir Emanuel uh, heard that there were Ethiopian Jews, and he wanted to find out what was their contact. What, you know, were they part of the Ethiopian community, or were they uh, followers of a tradition that was Ethiopian, and what we call philosophy tradition? And so he came to Rabbi Matthews in 1931 at the synagogue that was at 131 Street. That's the first synagogue. The later one that most of you all know, 87 West 128, was the second synagogue. Rabbi Matthews had him come, and he presented himself to the community, and he said, well, I am your lost brother. I am an Ethiopian who are part of the ancient tribes of Israel, and I heard that you were in tradition with us in the worship of the one God and the following of the Torah. And so that day was the beginning of the actual connection between an Ethiopian and Rabbi Matthews in the, in the, in the, um, in the synagogue. Later on, as most of you know, the, the war came in the 1930s. And the traveling of the Ethiopians back and forth was interrupted because of the war. However, Rabbi Matthews became so inspired that he became a major spokesman for the Ethiopian government here in New York. He was on the street corners. He was in the Ethiopian World Federation where he spoke on Sundays and gave messages about Haile Selassie and the ancient tribes of Israel and the Ark of the Covenant. And he gathered many people to his congregation from his lectures on the street and in the Ethiopian World Federation. The Second World War came to an end. And it, was, it, it came uh, to, I should say before the Second, Second World War, the Ethiopian government uh, had certain land that was available in Ethiopia. And that land, Haile Selassie trade, made an arrangement with Rabbi Ford that he should settle it and bring Afro-Americans over, those who looked at themselves as Ethiopians and those who worship in the tradition of the Ethiopian Jews. And so 
between 1930 and 1940, where the war, uh, the Second World War broke out, Rabbi Ford was able to set up certain functions in Ethiopia to entertain uh, Afro-Americans from his congregation here in Harlem. Two of those families that he brought over happened to be Parises and Bastions, who were my adopted parents. Rabbi Ford passed away in 1935, but he left the tradition and legacy with those who were there and with his wife, Mignon Ennis Ford, and the two sons that Rabbi Ford had in Ethiopia. They were there to uh, maintain a contact with America and the American Hebrews along with the Ethiopians. After the Second World War, there was a return of American Hebrew community, certain members of the American Hebrew community went back to Ethiopia. Some of you know Rabbi Israel, who was then Rabbi Wilkins in our time. And Rabbi Israel was a student of Rabbi Matthews. And what he did was continue the process of the transnational connection between Ethiopia and, and, and Americans. The uh, Rabbi uh, Wilkins congregation uh, gathered a certain amount of money. There were certain people in the congregation that took it upon themselves to go to, to, the, to Ethiopia and settle on the land. And one of those people you may know is Piper. Piper is an old family that came out of Rabbi Matthew's synagogue. He was there. Uh, his wife was there. And then and Mignon Ford was there. And those other Hebrews that came out of Rabbi Ford's synagogue all went to Ethiopia to settle there. The, uh, the, the continuation of that uh, process that, he, that, that, uh, that we call the Ethiopian Hebrew community, the building of that uh, uh, voyage, the, the building of, of connection between Ethiopia and Israel went on even after the Second World War. It wasn't until the time came when we uh, here in America became very strong, and as the sister brought out, we became very close to the Jewish world, and that to that extent, it, the movement to go to Ethiopia sort of slowed up, and everybody sort of turned to the Jewish community and became part of the process of, 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 of traditionally uh, making themselves uh, normalized within the religion. And that process of getting Jewish, going to the Jewish schools, and learning uh, the traditions of Talmud and Midrash, in a sense, took away the impetus that the older group had for going back to Ethiopia, for going back to what we would call the African Zion. And so the community split in two. Part of the community went back to uh, Ethiopia, continued from Beni Adat, and part of the community started to evolve themselves within the Jewish world. Now, in the transnational movement that, as, that existed in the time of uh, the early period of Rabbi Matthews and Rabbi Ford, uh, took a direction from another camp that came out of Chicago, and that is Ben Ami's camp. So what Ben Ami did the same thing that they did in the earlier period. He went to Africa, and he made con contact between Africa and Israel. He, did the same. he didn't go to Ethiopia, but he went to West Africa. And in the, in the process, uh, as God is waking up his people, in the process, everyone realized that they couldn't come back without going first to Africa. That is the seat of our existence, our beginning. Now, <laughs> to fortify this knowledge, and this is where I don't want to get into the controversy of the Jewish world, because we'll be here all night. <laughs> One of the things to shore us up, to make us know that we were on the right track, is that when we went into the archives of 
the Ethiopian history and matched it with the Bible and the, the telling of the Adam and Eve and the creation of, uh, of, of the Geon and the rivers that, uh, that surround Ethiopia. We find that many of the words in the Bible, or as my friend Dr. Ephraim Isaac says, there are 40 references to Ethiopia, but there is no reference to Russia. <laughs> you know, and that, Uh, what, bought, what, what made it very strong is that in the process of our research in Ethiopian history and its connection to the Bible, you have words that are in Hebrew. One of those words is geon. Geon means the Nile. But where did that word come from? Josephus, the great Jewish historian of the Roman period, said that the geon has its origin in the area that is East Africa. And how do we substantiate that? Because those of you who know Amharic know that the term for nation is the same term that's in the Bible, goyim. Goyim is the same term, means the nation. Goya means a nation. Gion means those that are around the Nile. That's the connecting link between Gaon and goyim. Now, when you look at the map, the Ethiopian map, there's an area in Gonda that is called Gojam. Gojam is the same Goyim because in Amharic, you can't, uh, there is no Yud, there's the J. And every Yud becomes a J. Every Goyim becomes a, a Gojam in the process of the elevation of the Hebrew language with its connection to Ethiopia or the Ethiopian connection to the Hebrew language. And so that was one set of uh, 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 identification of the purpose that Africa was the origin and the beginning of our existence. The another one was the Ark of the Covenant. The question is, when we talk about the Ark of the Covenant and that David, king of Israel, was giving the Ark and was given the permission uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, in, uh, to build and establish uh, the temple uh, with that which is the voice of God, the representation of God. When it came to the time when Solomon uh, did bad things, caused Israel to lose their way, and God caused Solomon to transfer that Ark of the Covenant by Ethiopian tradition to Ethiopia. So some people say, well, we don't believe that because Solomon and Sheba uh, are not African. But that's not true. Sheba, Sheba is uh, recently in the, in, the, in, the, in the research of uh, Ethiopian history, they found out that Sheba or Saba, which is the southern part of Yemen, which is the part that uh, the queen control, was also found to be in East Africa. There was sections and regions of Sheba in East Africa. Now that, give, give, that reminds me of what Dr. Ben used to say all the time when people ask Dr. Ben, well, what is this story about the King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba? And he said, well, this is the way you have to look at it. King Solomon married the Queen of Sheba, but the Queen of Sheba is the Empress of Ethiopia. He said, that's the way to look at it. And it seemed like the recent research showed that there were two sections of Ethiopia, both in the, uh, uh, the Arabian end and the section that is in East Africa. And that uh, tends to bear out a lot of what Dr. Ben was talking about. And so we, uh, we, we know that Sheba was part of Africa from that. We also know that the mother of Solomon was Bathsheba. And it doesn't take a genius to know that if you're Bathsheba, and you marry Malchus, but there got to be a connection here. <laughs> you know, I, I went to the Jewish bookstore. When the Jewish bookstore came, uh, uh, had this, uh, somebody felt like they want to do something with Queen of Sheba. And I asked her, I said, well, where's Solomon's mother? And she looked at me. You know, she didn't want to deal with the, the question that there's the connection there. Solomon was marrying into his, in his own people. See, and those people were like him, and he was like them. But that, that's, that's why you have Jews always talking about, well, I don't, I don't understand the story of the Queen of Sheba. 
uh, because they don't want to deal with the reality of what it means. And so that, that is part of what we learned in our research. This is part of what uh, I particularly did when everybody came back um, from, when we came back from uh, Ethiopia, and I uh, was part of the Reverend Matthews community, and then I went to Yeshiva University, my major uh, project was to learn the basic tenets of Judaism and also show the relationship to ancient Jews that were part of Africa. That was what it was all about. But many of the professors didn't go along with that. Uh, many of the professors today don't go along with it. And many of them in Israel, the chief rabbi, except for one, chief rabbi Avadi Yosef, most others uh, don't want to not only recognize the Ethiopian Hebrews, the Hebrew Israelites that are here and that have been following the faith for 90 and 100 years, but they don't want to recognize those who have been in Ethiopia for 3,000. <laughs> they don't even want to do that. So you got that problem, this transnational problem is universal to the Jewish world. They realize that they have a problem, but they can't solve it. And we're not going to disappear. So it's going to be there. <laughs> so uh, that's just a little bit of telling you uh, the problems that we had and, and have. And uh, Rabbi Matthews uh, continued uh, as he got older. He maintained the, the spirit of uh, the Ethiopian Hebrew congregation that he had. Uh, Rabbi Ford had given him his ordination. Some of you may know that. Um, the little story I have of the ordination, when Rabbi Matthews passed on and we went to the synagogue and somebody said, but where's the ordination that Rabbi Matthews got from Haile Selassie? So I said, when did Haile Selassie give ordination? <laughs> you know, when did, when did that happen? But when they, what they were really looking at is Rabbi Ford's ordination to Rabbi Matthews. And so the, when, you, when somebody asks you what gave Rabbi Matthews the spirit to do what he did and to talk, the talk as he did is because he had the encouragement from Rabbi Ford who went to Ethiopia and got the Kesim, was the word for priest, to write a documentation, an ordination that uh, uh, would give uh, Rabbi Matthews credit in the American black world. Now, just to show you another negative, I have to, I have to uh, bring this in because it, this is all part of the history. When Rabbi Matthews was asked to come down to Federation, of Jewish philanthropies, and there was this whole question again of recognizing black Jews, and he came down, uh, Rabbi Woods, when well, many of you know Rabbi Woods, we want to remember him, he was a strong candidate of Ethiopianism, you know, very strong on it, and Rabbi Woods took out of his wallet the ordination. <laughs> and he showed the ordination to Rabbi Trainin. He said, Rabbi Trainin, here's the ordination. What do you make of it? <laughs> Rabbi Trainer took the ordination, turned it around, and gave it to the judge. And said, Judge, what do you think of it? <laughs> you know? And then the judge gave it back to him, and he gave it back to Rabbi Woods, and they never said anything. They never said good or bad, right or wrong. There was no way of them to explain. It was nothing, it was nothing for them to do. So it, 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 the, the meeting really went into nothing. It, 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 it was a process to get the black Jews to be part of the Jewish world, and that process never happened. And so Rabbi Matthews did his best, uh, uh, was on TV, on radio, and uh, all the way up to when he got very old, he was still on radio, and uh, people still remember him. It's amazing how the, uh, the remembrance of Rabbi Matthews is within the black community, because commandment keepers has relit the world, you know, recently. And because, that's because of the 70 years. 70 years he spent teaching black history and the tradition and the connection of black people to Africa and to the ancient culture of Judaism. And that... <laughs> now my... Uh, um, what I, as the sister did mention, the rabbis in the community, uh, Rabbi Shalomo graciously uh, uh, wanted to help me to make it clear the people who uh, fostered the faith, who, who uh, 
committed themselves to congregations like Rabbi Poinsett and, and Rabbi Tate and Rabbi Moses and Rabbi Thomas and, uh, and those who were the commandment keepers all through the years. We want to remember them. And so uh, we have a slide projection that will give a, a, a very good summary of them and how they looked and what they participated in do, throughout the years. Yeah. Okay. Here's, here's a classic picture of Rabbi Matthews in the days when he was young and he was uh, reading the Torah. You know, many of you know, he, his tradition in reading the Torah was always to read the, what is it, Exodus 23, right? It was, I mean 19, Exodus 19, the Ten Commandments. They, they, that always had the Ten Commandments. And so uh, that's where he lived and he founded the congregation and the rabbinical college in 1925 and, the, and many community leaders. Uh, one of those community, one of, the, one of his co-workers, uh, Rabbi Arnold Ford, uh, was the director of the Universal Negro Improvement Association. Uh, uh, he wrote the anthem for the UNIA, and he founded Beth B'nai Abraham 1923. And then he immigrated to Ethiopia in 1930, and he gave his congregation over to Rabbi Matthews. Now, at the time, I should mention that there was eight there were eight black Jewish congregations. You, you, you wouldn't hear that from anybody else. Yeah, there were eight. And uh, Rabbi Ford and Rabbi Matthews, and there was uh, Rabbi Hort, Horton, uh, Mordecai Horton, and there was uh, uh, Herman, I mean to say, Mordecai Herman, and there was uh, one other person that we know of, but there were four others. So the, 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 the black community knew of themselves much more than we expect, or uh, we thought. We who grew up thought it was only those few, but it was a lot more than that. We have to remember the Belleville, Virginia. The, ben the Bethel group of Belleville, Virginia are in the thousands all over the country. We have to remember the congregation in Philadelphia. Uh, there's the Bethel in Philadelphia. Uh, there's Prophet Cherry that was um, uh, uh, one of the great speakers in the time of Rabbi Matthews in Philadelphia, and, and, and there was... Uh, uh, um, Rabbi Respies, who came out of that, and Rabbi Respies was a teacher of Rabbi Bowen. You see, it, it all comes down. So we had a lot of people in the old days. It wasn't just a few handful that you think it is. It was a lot more than a handful. Not to mention Chicago, where the rabbi uh, spoke of uh, 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 Rabbi Rubin and Green. Those are the rabbis that were the forerunners in Chicago and, uh, at this time. All right, um, here's uh, Marcus Garvey, uh, organized the UNIA and opened a, a branch in Harlem. And he had the world, the Black Star world, the Black Star uh, Cross nurses as well, and officially proclaimed the uh, blackness of Jesus. You know, that was, that was a lot of influence from Rabbi Matthews and Rabbi Ford. And if, I should tell you a little bit of the problem that they had with Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey knew and believed that Israel was African, just straight, without any modifications, that it was African. But when Garvey and Ford presented Marcus Garvey with the proposition, turned the UNIA <laughs> into a Jewish organization, <laughs> you know, oh, so he said, no, no we, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> no, I'm not going to touch that part of it. You know, what I'll do is make Jesus black. That's the first step. <laughs> you know, that's the first step. And the second step is to create a black church. And uh, there was a, a Bishop McGuire that existed at that time, and I think his uh, church is still existing now. It is a black church that has no connection to the AME or, or to, or, or to uh, mainline Protestantism or Catholicism. It was the independent black church that worshipped Jesus, the black Jesus. So there was no trouble. Now, nowadays, you're seeing a lot of black Jesus all around. <laughs> you know what I mean? You got a lot. Of, you, know, you, you don't have too much trouble these days, you know, because you had the brother that made, what was it, the black uh, uh, Jesus in, in um, what was that thing that he did? 
and the Madonna, right. Yeah. So anyway, so uh, uh, we've gone a long ways from the early days of, 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 uh, of uh, Marcus Garvey. So this is the synagogue that uh, Rabbi Ford had. Uh, this was basically Yiddish. It was a Yiddish. The choir, 1920s choir, had my uh, adopted mother, uh, Eudora Paris, and the two Bastion sisters. Most of you know the two sisters, Augustine and Ada Bastion. That's them. So they were there. And that, that picture is, is so valuable that the, the, that the Schomburg had that picture downstairs in the photographic room. Those of you who did research saw this outside. That was there. They liked that one for some reason. And it was there for many, many, many years. So th this is the classic picture of the choir that Rabbi Ford had and the uh, contribution that he made to the UNIA. And my uh, adopted parents through Ford went to Ethiopia and brought me back. So the problem uh, uh, the, with the Ethiopian uh, family uh, was that they, th they, they thought that this was some kind of a way of making the transitional stages between Ethiopia and uh, America easy and that I would contribute to the positive identification of Ethiopian Judaism and black Judaism. But I can tell you it's a struggle. <laughs> this identification isn't easy, <laughs> you know what I mean? It isn't too easy. Okay, now we have the other temple, the Morris Zionist temple. Let me explain that. That's a way of me explaining a little bit of Caribbean history. The, uh, as most of you know, in 1492 was the uh, expelling of, of the Sephardic Jews and Arabs, Muslims, uh, from Spain. What people don't pick up on, for whatever reason, is that when this explosion took place, many of the North African Jews, those who were Sephardic or Moorish, came over to the West Indies. And recently, an uh, ambassador for Israel's ambassador uh, to the West Indies wrote a book on the uh, connection of the Jewish people in the West, Indy, West Indies from the earliest period of the uh, slave period. And so this uh, Morris Zionist temple took their, uh, their desire to return to Africa, to North Africa. That's where the Moorish connection comes in. And uh, they were, in a sense, two doing the same thing that Rabbi Matthews did but they were doing it from a, a different uh, base. That was the Moorish base. Okay, here we have the front runners. Some of the ancient, I mean <laughs> the ancient, but some of the very old uh, 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 lead, uh, students, I should say, of Rabbi Matthews, uh, Rabbi Sa Smalls. Uh, here's a very young Rabbi Israel, 1919. And there's a very uh, uh, Rabbi uh, McLeod. That's Rabbi McLeod. This is a this is a very old picture, showing those who were the uh, students of Rabbi Matthews in the early days. Uh, this is the ceremony uh, at Commandment Keepers. Let's see. I think it says it in English. The, the, oh, Elder Scott, that's it. Elder Scott. Johannathan, that's right. You're right. Elder Scott, Johannathan. Uh, you have Stevens, Rabbi Matthews, Robert Steele, uh, Rabbi Woods, Levy, Yona, uh, Rabbi White, and Elder Matthias. I should make special mention to El Matthias's daughters in the audience. And <laughs> we grew up together many years of 204. Yeah, we, we remember those years. And uh, <laughs> we remember those years, and he, he was like a father, uh, El Matthias. Very uh, religious man, very religious. Uh, uh, okay. 
Oh, uh, this is the this is Rabbi Lazarus, Reuben, and Green, the forerunners to Rabbi Finney. The forerunners to Rabbi Finney. This is Chicago, right? This is in Chicago. Uh, I should say this publicly, uh, Rabbi Finney. After I told him the trouble we had with the Jewish community, he said, "Well, I'm not stopping, Rabbi. I'm going to keep battling it out." <laughs> so. So recently, the, the rabbi has become a member of the New, uh, Chicago Board of Rabbis. Well, I said, that's a great honor because Rabbi Matthews couldn't get that honor, and he was fighting for it for 50 years, and he couldn't get it, so somebody got it. So he, he's on the board of Chicago. Oh, this is the one the rabbi liked to show, because when he showed it at the, uh, at the function, at the, at the Schomburg, he surprised me because I didn't know that he had the picture. This, this is one of the early uh, bar mitzvahs that were taken at Kohal Beth Israel, Yisrael, uh, 204 Lennox Avenue. And these are the, uh, the minion. Uh, these are the two Thorn brothers that I, I was bar mitzvahed with over here. I was the smallest of everybody. <laughs> and Rabbi... Rabbi uh, McLeod and Rabbi Israel when he was Wilkins. And this is Rabbi Paltiel, Evelyn. Yeah. All of you remember Rabbi Evelyn? Yeah. And that's uh, Dr. Um, George. Remember Dr. George? And this was Brother Peterson. Now, Brother Peterson, uh, when we talk about the transnationalism and the fact that we try to encourage Ethiopians to come here and Americans to go to Ethiopia. Brother Peterson, who came from the Virgin Islands, uh, took the opportunity with his wife to go to Ethiopia and to live. And so he went and he contributed and he was, became a teacher like Mrs. Ford and raised a family. And uh, the family is here in America now and he passed away many years ago in Ethiopia. Uh, the um, no, I should say he passed away here in America after coming from Ethiopia in the late 80s. So Brother Peterson was another example of those who took the initiative to make contact with their African past. This is Zion House of Israel in Barbados. Uh, this is, what's that, Rabbi's name? Hines. Yeah, Rabbi Hines. Now, Rabbi Evelyn, the one that I showed before, was the person who uh, initially became the rabbi. So Beckles was the founder of House of Zion. Beckles was the founder of House of Zion. And at the time when, uh, uh, and she was pretty old, she asked Rabbi Moses and Rabbi Levy to come down and to open up the synagogue in the 80s. Is that right? Oh, seven, eight, 70s, in the 70s, right. And so the two congregations joined together. I think that the first time you had two Hebrew congregations together in the, in the real sense of the word. <laughs> you know, we, we, we both went down and opened up House of Zion and dedicated it, and we stayed a, a few days, isn't it? Yeah, we stayed a few days. Excuse me? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, oh, yeah, I forgot. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. So that, that, so that, that we, we, we were positive. As a rabbi, I like to say, we are international. And Barbados put us in the international map. <laughs> ah, here's another classic picture of the first board of black rabbis. Now, as most of you know, we have the board that's called the International Board of, of Rabbis. Uh, that uh, uh, our president, Rabbi Shalomo, is the president of, and, uh, and is, that is international because the rabbi in Barbados is a member, and the rabbis in Chicago is also a member, and, uh, and the rabbi in Philadelphia is also a member, right? And so we have, we have a membership of, what do you say, 10, 12? 10 or 12. That, so that it's grown from, the, from this day. This is way back. Uh, this must be back in the 50s, right? 
early 60s. This is back in early 60s, and the same people, it's, this is the one person that you didn't see before. That's Stevens. That's Rabbi Stevens. He's not with us anymore. Here's the rabbi's uh, father, chief rabbi. And Shalom. Shalom. Uh, yes, Rabbi Matthews, yeah, that's understood. And Smalls, Matthews and Smalls, right. That's right. And Rabbi Levy, yeah. Okay, uh, all right. All right. The, w here's the diversity. This is the diversity that the Jewish world isn't too anxious to know about, but we're going to keep plugging. Ethiopian Jews, Lamba, those are the ones in southern Africa. By Abayadaya, that's the ones in Uganda. Uh, by the way, the Bayadaya rabbi is being ordained by the University of Judaism in California. Gershom, Rabbi Gershom. And, and if you want to know why does he have to go to California, 3,000 miles away, is because the conservative movement that is here in New York refused Rabbi Israel, I mean Dr. Israel, that is the uh, Nigerian Hebrew that was at Bet Shalom, spent one Sabbath in Bet Shalom, they denied him entry for the rib, 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 rabbinate. And from that time, they shifted. They won't bother. The West Coast is part of the East. But somewhere along the way, they say, you better ease up someplace. <laughs> Give the Hebrews a chance. And so uh, Gershom got his entry, went to Israel, and came back and should be graduating from the University of Ju uh, Judaism this year, I believe it's this year. I'm not too sure. I believe so. But uh, just for, for while I'm at it, the reason why the the reason why you see uh, American Jews go in and out with this thing is because unknown to us, people around the world is recognizing Israel. You have in France the Reform Temple, uh, the Reform Movement of France has a Burundi rabbi that is being ordained as a rabbi, and he's a Burundi. You understand it? In Europe, they have more understanding of the African Jew than they have in America. America is way behind. There's another example of the African Jew being recognized, is that when Dr. Flaiklovich, I didn't talk about him because I didn't want to get tied up with the politics with, with Jews, when Dr. Flaikovich was fighting for Ethiopian Jews, both the black American, Ethiopian Hebrew, and the Ethiopian Jews, and he went all around the country trying to get money, all he couldn't get is $30,000. I mean, that's no support. I mean, not from Jews. $30,000. That's like a couple of pennies. <laughs> you, know, you can't go too far with that. But anyway, well, this was in the 20s, 30s, so you could say... It's, it's, it's not now, it was then, but the Jews still had money then too. But anyway, the, the, Dr. Flankovich fought for them and, uh, and he, he got Ethiopian Jews into Florence, Italy. So when people tell you, if they ever tell you that Jews don't recognize black, that's a lie. The Florentine rabbinical school recognized Betty Israel back in the 20s and 30s. And when the time came for Betty Israel to go to Israel, and somebody said, who's going to be their rabbi? Well, Avada Yosef, who is the Iraqi, Sephardic Iraqi rabbi, who one time was chief rabbi of Egypt, was in charge in Israel in the 70s. And he ordained uh, uh, Yosef Adani as the chief rabbi of Betty Israel. And he ordained that on two reasons. One, the uh, 1,500 years of Sephardic history that points a finger to Ethiopians as Jews. And two, the fact that the Florentine Rabbinic College always recognized, the Italian Jewry always recognized the black Jews of Ethiopia, going back 40, 50 years. Now, nobody's going to tell you that. You have to read that in the archives. In Yeshiva University, I read it in a book that's, that's hidden up in the stack. <laughs> you, know, you almost got to go up on, the, on a whole chair to get it down. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable what the history that we've gone through. Uh, the pain. This is the, uh, the synagogue I remember when I first went in. 
in uh, 87 West. <laughs> Many of us grew up in 87 West. Yeah, we remember this. Yeah. Uh, we spent a lot of time in this, a lot of time in this synagogue. And the commandment keep it. Yes, it's a commandment keep it synagogue, right. It's a commandment keep it synagogue. Oh, I, I, I got a tremendous story about the wife of the rabbi of this synagogue, the Ashkenazi wife. And uh, it had to do with one of our members who passed away. It was, um, who's with me? Pilgrim. Pilgrim. Yeah, Sister Pilgrim, right. Right, yeah, that's the one, right? That had the connection. Okay, so what happened is, Sister Pilgrim was sick and they took her to the hospital and she subsequently passed away. And we, as you know, in Jewish tradition, you have the tahara, and you have the prayers and the tehillim, and all of that you have to do before you come to the service the next morning. And they have women, the funeral uh, chapels have women who take care of tahara, the cleaning of the body. And one of the women that came to Sister Pilgrim to do the honor was the rabbi, wife of the rabbi that was last here at Williamsburg, Young Israel. How fantastic is that? You know, that Hashem worked it out, that this, this connection was done through Hashem. And, and the woman, she was flabbergasted. She didn't realize, she didn't even realize the synagogue was still here. They th she thought they broke it down. That was gone. She had, she had no idea that people, the Israelites were keeping the building going for years. And she got, got to the crying state. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is a, to the Rabbi, Rabbi Matthew's um, uh, cemetery, right? This is Rabbi Matthew's cemetery. Yeah. What's the name of that? Yeah, Frederick Douglass. This is Frederick, right before we got very Jewish, with Jewish cemeteries, <laughs> we, we used to go to Frederick Douglass in the old days. And this was one of the last pictures, I think, from the Frederick Douglass time. Thank you very much for listening to us. Don't let